Why would Christian men indulge in spending more time with their friends than they do with their wives and their children? There are many Christian husbands that act or that have supplanted the place of God. They have supplanted the place of God in their homes. Their determinations have nothing to do with him. Their determinations are based simply on wanting to establish their authority in the house. And they don't care how it is done, it has to be done. Believers. Your wives can ask questions. When they ask questions, you say they are not submissive. Your wives can't object to anything that you have decided to do or what you are doing, whether it is right or wrong. If she does, she's not submissive. And then you become a source of temptation to the Christian wife. Some of us are so full of ourselves. And we're Christians. Whereas there is a clear standard in the scriptures. Imitate God as their children. What did he do? The Bible says, even in marriage, it says, the husband ought to love his wife, even us. Imitate him. Be as he is. Someone says, but this is a tough call. Yes, it is. But this is what the faith is about. It's about the divine regulation of every aspect of your life. I'm very strong in my church life. But I'm very shrewd in my business life. You know, this is business. This is business. This is not, not be church. Not be church, but this is not business. You cannot compartmentalize your life. There is only one life to live. And that life flows into these many aspects. And through them, Christ must be honored and glorified. Children who go to church, raised in Christian homes, don't identify. When they are out of the home, they don't identify with Christ. When they're in school, they don't go to fellowship. To them, it's freedom. Now I'm no longer on that. Daddy said, Mommy said, I can do whatever I want to do. Nobody should talk to me. That's fair enough. Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, makes that clear. It says, Young man, young woman, say, feel free, enjoy this life. Fulfill all your desires and pleasures. Enjoy it to the maximum. But don't forget that a time cometh when you will give account of your life. Light and darkness can't mix. It's not possible. If you as a believer exposed to those temptations and you can conform, something is wrong. It's not like I didn't try. There is no Christian who will move in the wrong direction without compunction in his heart. If there is no compunction in your heart, find your way to the altar of God and ask for your death 
so that you can live. In sackcloth and ashes. Ask the Lord to help you break your fallow ground so that his seeds can be sown and you can, can, and it can germinate and bring forth the fruit of God in your life. So you can bear the fruits of righteousness. Parents say, A. Especially godly parents. And you know the counsel is from God. And you have Christian children who keep resisting the counsel of God. Read through the book of Proverbs. <laughs> My son, despise not the counsel of your father. It was it not to the king Lemuel or whatever? What's the name of that king? It's Lemuel, right? Yeah, that the mother gave counsel to. And the Lord said, pay attention to the words of your mom. Christianity is practical. It's not just about the Greek and the Hebrew. Those things are good to help you to gain understanding. But it should never end there. Your life must conform to the character of Christ. I've been a believer for more than four decades of my life. Almost five. And I'm still seeking to attain. And every day I see areas in which I need help. In thought, in word, and in deed. And I cry to God, God never let go of me. There is no point of arrival until we stand face to face with the Lord and hear those words well done thou good and faithful servant there is no point of arrival this is the whole essence of the message following Jesus it's a call that we must respond to you respond to the call then he qualifies you he makes you meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And he empowers you to succeed. But you don't succeed until you obey. Hence he says, to your faith, add. So that you will have a rich entrance toward God. So that you will not be barren and fruitless. For if you are, he says, then you are short-sighted and you have forgotten that you were delivered from your past sins. 1 John chapter 4. Let's start from 7. I just want to help us to see just one thing that the Bible says, follow those who follow Christ. Now we've talked about the signs that follow those who follow Christ. We didn't exhaust it. We just mentioned a few of them. Now I want to talk, switch and talk about other things that follow those who follow Christ. And the key point in this is that those who follow Christ have an assurance. They have a confidence. In the language of the King James, they have boldness in the day. Of judgment. Verse 17, let me just read that and then we'll walk our way backwards. It says in 1 John 4 and verse 17, Hearing is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment is a consequence. 
It's not a gift. As a matter of fact, it's a product of following Jesus. And it tells us exactly why. If you read on, it says, because as he is, so are we in this world. And that is often misunderstood. But we'll get to it. Go to verse 7. Let me just read from here and I'll point a few things out. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is what? Is born of God and knoweth God. Those who know God love. It is it is the it is the the stamp that authenticates their faith their knowledge of the Lord. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth, everyone that loveth, the word loveth, is not just everyone that loved, but everyone that is loving the present continuous term. One whose lifestyle is to love the brethren. For a good number of us, we say, oh, I love, but there's always a but. Don't you know how they are? Don't you know what they said? Don't you know what they've done? There's always that limitation. I can love you thus far, but I can't go beyond this. Forgetting that any person who is born by the Spirit of God has an eternal capacity to love. And that there are no boundaries to the love that we exercise. I told you the story of a woman whose, whose son was killed by a friend or so, or another person. And then the man went to prison. And when he came out, he went to meet the mother. He got saved in prison, so he then went to meet the mother of the fellow he killed. And the woman, too, was a believer. Can you imagine somebody knocking the door of your house, opens the door, and then you see the killer of your son? And he apologized profusely, explained and explained and explained and explained. To cut a long story short, the woman forgave him and adopted him as his son, as her son. Awa. Yeah. Your friends, family, maybe even some pastors will come to you and tell you that something is wrong with you. An eternal capacity to love. Four hundred and ninety times in one day, he says, continue to walk in forgiveness. We say it is not human to do that. Of course it's not. Are you a mere man? You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are the workmanship of God. That is contrary to nature. Yeah? But you ought to be living the supernatural life. Ah, it can't happen. I can't. Yes, you can. Because there is grace enough. Verse 8. He that knoweth not Oh, sorry, he that loveth not, concluded here is what? Knoweth not God. For God is what? 
is love. You don't know him. If you know him, you will love. If you love, that's proof that you are born again. It's very clearly defined here, therefore, that the life of the saint must be defined by loving other saints. What has this got to do with the day of judgment? Why is God tying this to it? Hey, if you have done this, one of these little ones, he says, you have done it unto me. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. You didn't feed me when I was hungry. You ignored me when I was imprisoned. You didn't shelter me when I had no shelter. As long as you've done it to one of these, you've done it to me. Why, when God arrested Paul, what did he say to Paul? Or Saul? He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Persecute his church, you persecute him. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his son, his only begotten son, into the world that we might live through him. Hearing is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, if God so loved us, complete it. Say it again. Say it one more time. So it says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. This is the basis of its definition in um, Ephesians 5, when he says, be imitators of me as their children, and love one another even as Christ has loved you, he said. So when he says, imitate me, follow me, he's talking about the path of love and righteousness. No man had seen God at any time. No man had seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. If we love one another, God abides in us. If we love one another, God's presence settles in us. That means that the active presence of God in a believer is in the manifestation of love. He continues and says, and his love is what? Perfected in us. And if you look at this, it may not necessarily say exactly what it is that it has said. That is, you may not exactly see exactly what it is it means. But let's go back to verse 13. I want to show you something. Sorry, verse uh, 11. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Next verse. We ought also to love one another. And his love is perfected in us. So, his love is perfected in us when we actively love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. I don't know. Can you see that? Yeah. The way to perfect God's love in us. Now, this is, it mentions two things here. There is a love of God toward us. That's what saved us. There is a love of God in us or perfected in us and that is done when we actively love one another and the love of God is perfected in us 
Hereby know we that we dwell in him. And he in us. Because he had given us his spirit. And if you read through the book of Romans chapter 5, I think it's verse 5, it says that the spirit of God has shed his love abroad in our hearts. So he's talking about the same thing still. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. And when you read this, you tend to think that, oh, yeah, we have seen and now we testify. We are telling people everywhere that the father sent the son. No, that's not the meaning of that. If you read through John, the gospel of John, he says that if you love, if you have love one to another, then men will know that God sent me. So the true force in our testimony of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ sent by God to pay the price for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness is when we actively exercise love one toward another. Then men will know, he says, that the Father has sent me, Jesus said. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. And the one who does not practice love consistently, the conclusion is clear when you read this verse. Then he said, in this hearing, in this is our love made perfect. That we may have what? Boldness in the day of judgment. So when we stand before God, our heads will not be bowed in shame. And that boldness and assurance begins now. And every man who follows the Lord knows without any shadow of doubt that he has pleased God. And pleasing God is the key factor. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's an established thought in the scriptures. There's a path in which we must walk. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love. Perfected love casted out fear. So when you say perfect love casted out fear, let's not forget the context in which this is spoken. Perfected love casted out fear. How do you perfect that love? Hearing is the love of God made perfect. How do you cast out fear of the day of judgment? By walking in love. One toward another. Actively. Practically. That's how you cast out fear. And have boldness. Usually when people make commentaries on on this session they, they, they make commentaries that are not properly thought through so they just conclude that once you get born again you are as he is and because you are as he is there is no fear that's not what God is talking about here there's a follow up you get born again to love then you love indeed in that your love is made perfect and as your love is being made perfect, fear is disappearing. And what are you carrying with you everywhere? Boldness. And what is the, the source and the reason of that boldness? 
Let's read on because it didn't stop at that. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So the, the way to, to cast that fear away is to be perfected in love. Next verse says, we love him because he, lo he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, you see, he's bringing it back again to the same point. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. So the man, a man who says he loves God and is walking in hate or in bitterness, unforgiveness, malice, and all those other things, a man who does that, passions that condemn, a man who does that, the Bible says he's a liar. That liar has not cast out fear. There is fear in his heart on the day of, to, in of the day of judgment, or as he anticipates the day of judgment. He says, and I read again, if a man say, I love God, and hated his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he had seen, how can he love God, whom he had not seen? And this commandment, the commandment to love, have we from him. It's a commandment to love that we have from him. He says that he who loveth God, love his brother also. It is clear the direction in which the scripture is speaking. Boldness in the day of judgment. You can cultivate it. This is an encouragement to every one of us to keep the focus of our attention on the Lord and that we should walk in his ways. Let's begin to dismantle those bad habits of sin and change those attitudes that don't rightly represent him. Let's begin to pay attention to the word of God and weigh it like a garment over our minds, putting on the mind of Christ, thinking like him, allowing the discipline of the Holy Spirit to regulate our lives and move us in the direction of his will. Let us keep these things inside of us and learn that this is the way and that there are blessings and benefits that accrue to us if we obey his commandment if we obey his commandments there are blessings that accrue to us because we are his Christianity is practical it's practical your life must change your life must change. Let truth, sincerity, honesty be established within you. Heed the counsel of the Holy Ghost. Love. 